I'm Willie Harris, and this is the fifth and final lecture under Module 2, How Florida Soils Interact with Phosphorus. Under the general set of lectures, Phosphorus in Agricultural Watersheds, Science and Applications. Lecture 5 addresses the risk assessment implications of manure amended, fertilizer amended, and naturally phosphatic soils. Learning objectives of this lecture are to convey familiarity with the nature of naturally phosphatic soils, which can occur extensively in some areas of Florida, and also to convey understanding and appreciation of how the form of phosphorus makes a difference in its potential fate in soils. For lecture five, we'll compare different phosphorus forms with respect to water-soluble phosphorus versus total phosphorus relations, and water-soluble phosphorus versus soil test P relations. Using water-soluble phosphorus is kind of a surrogate for the potential for the phosphorus to be released from soil into solution in a natural setting. We'll also address the nature of phosphate minerals in Florida, phosphatic soils. For example, why water-soluble phosphorus is unrelated to total phosphorus and soil test phosphorus for these soils. The depth weathering trends for phosphatic soils and a little about the nature of phosphate nodules. We'll present an approach for predicting phosphatic soil occurrence give examples of anthropogenic phosphate minerals, and I'll have a few take-home points and references. I'm going to present a series of charts that show the relationship between water-soluble phosphorus and total phosphorus, or different forms of phosphorus. These charts contain data that were derived from a thesis by Daniel Herrera in 2003. The top chart here is for phosphatic soils. Here we can see there is essentially no relationship between water-soluble phosphorus and, and total phosphorus. Even though water-soluble phosphorus is elevated uh, for some samples slightly, so even at very high total phosphorus, water-soluble phosphorus is not extremely high. In the middle chart, we have data for amure, manure amended soils. And here, in this case, we have a very strong relationship between water soluble phosphorus and total phosphorus. And you don't have to increase total phosphorus that much before you significantly increase water soluble phosphorus. In the bottom chart, we have data for inorganically fertilized soils. And in this case, the take home is that there is no buildup, no essentially no buildup, not compared to the manure amended soils situation. There's no buildup in it for inorganically fertilized soils of phosphorus in the surface horizon. And that would be, you can relate that to the, to the high solubility of inorganic uh, phosphorus fertilizers, basically salts. I think that if you take a look at these three plots, you can see that the form of phosphorus markedly, markedly makes a difference in the potential for elevated phosphorus in solution. Here we're comparing the relationship between water soluble phosphorus and soil test phosphorus for different forms of phosphorus, phosphatic soils at the top manure, amended soils in the middle, and inorganically fertilized soils at the bottom, with water-soluble phosphorus being on the y-axis and soil test phosphorus, either malic 1 or malic 3, left to right, on the x-axis. We can see that for phosphatic soils, there is essentially no relationship between soil test phosphorus and water-soluble phosphorus, that even high levels of soil test phosphorus do not uh, equate to extremely high levels of water-soluble phosphorus. Uh, 
at least not compared to manure emitted soils, which is in the middle, where we see a strong relationship between soil test phosphorus, both measures, uh, malic 1 and malic 3, uh, and water soluble phosphorus. That is, as soil test phosphorus increases, water soluble phosphorus increases appreciably. In the bottom two charts, we have inorganically fertilized soils. The buildup of soil test phosphorus is not nearly as high in inorganically fertilized soils. And uh, hence, the, and the buildup of water soluble phosphorus also is not nearly as high, and there's very little relation between the two. Again, inorganically fertilized soils were amended with essentially fertilizer salts, highly soluble, and are not likely to be retained in the surface to build up significantly. Hence, the relationships for uh, both total phosphorus and soil test phosphorus are similar with respect to the three different forms of phosphorus that could occur in Florida soils. And uh, there is a marked difference between these forms and their potential to release phosphorus into solution and their potential for buildup in the case of manure amended soils versus inorganically fertilized soils. Moving to the nature of phosphate minerals in Florida phosphatic soils and to the question of why is water soluble phosphorus unrelated to total phosphorus and soil test phosphorus for phosphatic soils whereas there is a strong relationship in the case of manure amended soils and inorganically fertilized soils. Well, the weathering products of geologic phosphate are stable in acidic soils, and soils in Florida tend to be acidic. And an example I'm going to give here is aluminum phosphate mineral, is the, the aluminum phosphate mineral wavelight, and I'll illustrate that in this diagram. We can see that if we're looking on the y-axis, we're looking at the phosphate concentration in solution, the log of that, and the and pH versus pH. So we can see if we look at the mineral, the minerals in this chart, we have the most stable of those would be at low pH would be wavelight, which is aluminum which is a form of aluminum phosphate, a, a very common aluminum phosphate mineral in Florida at low, lower pH. And at higher pH, is fluorapatite would be the most stable. So we can see that as we move into the lower pH range, which would occur in a soil with weathering, that wavelite would be less soluble, that is, it, it would require less phosphate in activity in solution to be stable and it, its solubility would be lower than fluorapatite in a pH say below 5.5. That means that aluminum phosphate in soils is there because it is stable and it has resisted being weathered out, whereas fluorapatite is not stable in acidic environments. And the even though it was the carbonate fluorapatite was the original form of phosphorus in these phosphate parent materials, in an acidic environment the the, fluor, the fluorapatite is dissolved, the, the phosphorus that is released is becomes associated with aluminum and hence you end up with wavelite. Uh, the chart below represents a typical weathering distribution of phosphate minerals in Florida phosphatic soils. By that I mean soils forming from phosphate rich parent materials, which are pretty extensive in Florida. They represent a weathering sequence roughly of, for phosphate minerals of fluorapatite under the least weathered condition, the crandallite intermediate weather condition to wavelight in the most intensively weather condition. We can see that represented with depth in under the under the phosphates in this chart with fluorapatite 
being possibly more stable deeper in this soil environment and wavelight having replaced it completely in the most intensively weathered part of the soil profile which is the near surface and the intermediate weathering zone contains can contain a mixture of minerals of, of variable uh, stability in an acidic environment here I've related this to a, to a soil profile A, E, B, T, B, T, G, and C, G, which would be fairly common in a phosphatic soil. It's not pertinent for our discussion today, but on the right is a comparison, a paragenesis comparison, basically, of weathering sequences for phyllosilicates, which would be paralleling the, the phosphate weathering sequence you see. For those that are interested. I know this is not a clay mineralogy lecture, but I couldn't resist including some clay mineralogical data. These are stacked x-ray diffraction patterns for samples collected at various locations in Alachua County, Florida by then master student Rabinda Ramnarain, now Dr. Ramnarain. What it shows is just how ubiquitous the mineral, the untouted mineral, I might say, wavelight, aluminum phosphate, is where you have soils that are highly weathered and forming in phosphate-rich geologic material. So the, in this case, the, the W stench is used to designate the mineral wavelite. So the peaks that are attributable to wavelite are label with W. And kaolinite and quartz are, are also labeled. Phosphate minerals commonly serve as cement in phosphate nodules. Here I have uh, some images of phosphate nodules. The image in A is a nodule that uh, was subjected to scanning electron microscope examination in cross-section, you can see that there's a lighter zone uh, in the image. This is the backscatter image. So the lighter zone illustrates higher atomic number. And then we have a darker zone, and that illustrates lower atomic numbers. So we're inferring that uh, silicon dioxide or it basically, uh, silicon has a relatively low atomic number, and these areas are quartz grains. And the cement is is uh, elevated in iron content, which creates the lighter image in, in the backscatter. So in this case, the, the cement is contains both iron and phosphate minerals. The phosphate minerals are confirmed by X-ray diffraction. It illustrates the point that phosphate nodules actually are nodules. That is, they, they are aggregated parts of the soil matrix that are cemented together subsequent to you know, the uh, weathering process. And in this case, it's, it's the, the cementing material that contains the phosphate. In the lower nodule, we have um, another SEM image showing typical crystal morphology, uh, lath and acicular kinds of morphologies, euhedral uh, crystals of wavelite. And this mineral is, the, the wavelite is actually the cementing agent for this nodule as well. In this, in both cases, the this illustrates that phosphate can accumulate and be one of the most stable weathering products in uh, in Florida phosphatic soils. Hence, it's not likely to be in uh, significantly elevating soil water, soil poor water phosphorus. These are the wavelike crystals I was referring to. Where are phosphatic 
soils found? Well, that question probably has to be addressed regionally, but I have an example from north central Florida, specifically Alachua County in uh, vicinity. This is a schematic cross section that uh, shows a Dakota escarpment and a plateau to the east and uh, an area of limestone with uh, most of the phosphate rich material uh, removed probably by marine transgression. So where we tend to find phosphatic soils would be where that material is exposed most in closest proximity to the surface. And so you can see that, uh, that the hypothesized phosphatic soil zone area there is where that is the case in this particular uh, schematic. And there are also pockets uh, of phosphatic material remaining out into in the, in the plain area where most of it has been removed, but there are still small areas that they can be uh, encountered. You can look at the my uh, legend showing the undifferentiated tertiary quaternary sediments at the top of the plateau, the phosphate-rich deposits, and then the underlying Eocene limestone in this particular scenario. The presence of phosphatic soils is less uh, likely, or the, the likelihood of encountering them is less on the plateau because of the thickness of the undifferentiated tertiary quaternary sediments. Most of the soils there are in are controlled by those sediments rather than the underlying phosphate-rich deposits. However, the phosphate-rich deposits do constitute an aquitard uh, and can maintain poor drainage in some in large areas of the plateau or flatwoods. This is an elevation or topography map with the dark areas being the plateau and uh, the area of, along the scarp where I-75 is running in the northern part of the county. And the lighter area being the limestone plain where it's at a lower elevation and most of the phosphatic geologic material has been removed by marine transgression, presumably. So if we're looking for phosphatic soils, we'd be looking at the dissected area or that you can probably pick up by looking uh, in the vicinity of uh, Interstate 75 uh, in the northwestern part of the county. This map uh, depicts the, the relative probability of finding phosphatic soils in Alachua County, Florida, based on the concepts that we just discussed. And this map can be compared to the previous one in relate, uh, topographically. Here we can see that the probability of finding a phosphatic soil is low in the eastern part of the county for the most part, which is on the plateau where there is a fairly thick veneer of pliopleistocene sediments. And it's high where that plateau has been dissected. Uh, we can see that in, in the color red. And it's medium in areas uh, below the escarpment, uh, the limestone plain, where there, most of the phosphate has been removed, by, presumably by marine planation, but some of it is still left in pockets. And so there is some possibility, some probability that, that you can encounter a phosphatic soil, a naturally phosphatic soil. It's important to understand the distribution of phosphatic soil so that you can take them into account and not consider the elevated soil test phosphorus as an indication that, that farmers have overapplied phosphorus. And taking also into account that high soil test phosphorus or total phosphorus don't necessarily mean uh, extremely high elevations of water-soluble phosphorus. 
since phosphatic soils are outliers with respect to water soluble phosphorus and uh, total or soil test phosphorus measurements. Here are a couple of examples of anthropogenic phosphate minerals. The first one is kind of a quaint example. It's an oyster shell from a Florida Native American coastal shell midden mound, which shows a dark patina. And uh, you can see the dark arrow here, a poorly crystalline apatite on the shell. This was a case where the phosphorus in the refuse that was discarded in the mound made its way down to the oyster shell and reacted with the calcium in it to form the, the apatite patina. In the bottom picture, you see the, the blue color, which is the mineral vivianite, which precipitated on an aggregate from a ditch near a dairy barn in uh, the Okeechobee Basin. The ditch was rich in organic matter in conditions where the oxidation reduction potential was probably very low and that would foster the precipitation of vivianite since vivianite is a ferrous phosphate mineral. I have what I think are particularly important take home points for this lecture. Total phosphorus and soil test phosphorus are not indicators of phosphorus leaching risk for phosphatic soils. Hence, phosphatic soils foil phosphorus loss risk assessments based on soil test phosphorus. It is important to distinguish cases where elevated soil test phosphorus is attributable to native phosphorus and not to the farmer applications. Two ways of doing this are documenting anomalously low water soluble phosphorus to soil test phosphorus values and documenting that soil test phosphorus values do not decline with soil depth. Phosphorus applied as inorganic fertilizer doesn't accumulate appreciably in sandy soils because it is leached if it's not assimilated by crops. But phosphorus supplied as dairy manure does accumulate to constitute a legacy of long-term elevated phosphorus that can be released from soils.